Hey y'all, I'm Cece, and today I'm here to talk about adaptations. So, hello there. Been a bit of a minute. <laughs> I've been taking some much needed time, but I am here, I am back, I am doing a video, and specifically I am doing a video about adaptations because in all of the time that I have been taking a break, it feels like all I've been doing is watching adaptations and loving so many of them. And even besides the shows that I have been watching and loving, there are also a few new ones on the horizon or shows that just came out that I'm also very excited to get to that happen to be based on books. That's like the theme of this year, the last couple years, and it brings me a lot of joy as a person who loves to read. And I think you all know my two passions in this life are books and television. So since it has been a while since I have shared the stuff I've been loving, I thought I would talk to you more about some of the adaptations I've been watching over the last few months, what I thought of them, and a couple that I am most excited to get to soon. Now, just before we get into talking about these shows, I would like to thank Acorn TV so much for partnering with me on this video. I have been an avid viewer of so much on Acorn's platform over the years, so I am like beyond excited that I get the chance to work with them. Acorn TV is a streaming service providing the best of Britain and beyond, including a bunch of the detective shows that I have been watching forever, Midsummer Murders, Murdoch Mysteries, Agatha Christie's Poirot, like basically those three have always been on at my house. There is also so much more available on Acorn TV's platform. A subscription is only $5.99 a month and if you check out the link in my description you can go ahead and go sign up. Plus if you use my promo code BOOKNERD30 you are going to get a 30-day free trial of Acorn TV. Their platform has a ton of different adaptations including the brand new show Whitstable Pearl which is actually the most recent adaptation I watched and loved, so without further ado, let me talk to you about that, plus tell you more about all of the adaptations I have been binging lately. So first up, let me talk to you about Whitstable Pearl. This is a brand new series available on Acorn TV, and it is based on the Whitstable Pearl mystery series, a series of cozy mystery books by best-selling author Julie Wassmer. Whitstable Pearl follows single mother Pearl, who co-owns and runs a seafood restaurant with her mom in the small coastal town of Whitstable. So when her friend dies under mysterious circumstances, Pearl's experience as a private investigator come in handy. She starts trying to work on the case and ends up working more and more with out-of-towner Chief Inspector Mike McGuire to unravel that mystery and to kind of put together a bunch of Whitstable's other secrets. Let me just take a moment to say that being able to talk about this show is such a thrill because I have been watching stuff on Acorn TV for so long that like while I was working on this a couple of other people in my family had already started watching the show without knowing that I was like working on anything related to it at all and that's mostly because Whitstable Pearl features so many of the things that I love about like British detective TV. I love a small town full of secrets first of all. Because I love a show that engages with a wide cast of characters, it's fun to kind of piece together all of the little things about everybody. Plus I'm such a fan of like the odd village character. <laughs> I think I first kind of fell in love with it watching Doc Martin with my mom, and I think that this honestly has a lot of comparisons that you could make to Doc Martin, but also like the darker side of the odd village character, which reminded me a ton of Broadchurch another detective series I happen to love. <laughs> the heart of the thing is, though, because I have watched so much crime-solving TV, the thing that it always comes down to, whether or not it is a series I love, an adaptation I love, it's about the characters. Which is exactly why I think Whitstable Pearl works, because Carrie Godleyman plays the main character, Pearl, I adore Carrie Godleyman. <laughs> Over the last year I have binged like the entirety of Taskmaster and she has been one of my favorite contestants. And I'm also a huge fan of the other lead, played by Howard Charles, 
who you might remember from Shadow and Bone. <laughs> if you didn't recognize him right away, that's okay. It's because they are two such distinct characters that it completely blew me away and it took me ages to even figure out that it was the same actor. <laughs> the two of them bring so much heart to Pearl, to Mike, to the rest of the characters. Plus it's a series that's based so much on Pearl's relationship to her mom and the fact that she's a single mom raising her son. Every time a crime show starts to involve family Family as well. I'm always just a little bit more into it. So to sum up, Whitstable Pearl is incredibly atmospheric. It features a huge cast of characters that you get to learn a little bit about in every episode, which I love. Plus it has main characters that like totally have that chemistry, but they also get to have their moments where they get to engage with grief and loss on their own and together, which is yet another brilliant thing. <laughs> if you're looking for a good atmospheric murder mystery to binge over the weekend, highly recommend that you check out Whitstable Pearl. So since I was just talking about Howard Charles in Shadow and Bone, let me talk about Shadow and Bone for a second. Shadow and Bone is the adaptation of some of the novels within Lee Bardugo's Grishaverse. Specifically, the first season is adapted from Shadow and Bone, and it includes characters from Six of Crows, but it doesn't really include the storyline itself yet. So, Shadow and Bone follows Alina, who is a map maker in the First Army, who is forced to confront far more intense enemies than she ever anticipated when she discovers that she has a hidden ability. So Alina works on honing her skills and taking her place in a much bigger universe while everyone else in the world kind of converges in on her. I read Shadow and Bone, but I did not end up reading the next two books in the series. I wound up skipping them because I didn't I didn't care for the book, but I did wind up reading Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. They're two of my favorite books of all time. This series was so good. <laughs> I have been incredibly worried, mostly because of the fact that uh, I've been stressed that I would only like the characters I cared about in the books, and I was worried about getting invested in some of the characters that are from the original Grisha trilogy. I guess it's now the Shadow and Bone trilogy. But I loved so much what this adaptation did with Alina and, I mean, honestly, with Mal, who I didn't know that much about in the book. It was just kind of like glazed over me, you know? It developed those characters into people I cared about. Plus the other thing that I love about this series is that it really manages to balance tone, I think, where it is a pretty dark show at times. It deals with some intense topics, but it also has its great moments of levity, in particular related to a goat, <laughs> if you've watched the show. Honestly, if you haven't watched the show, you probably at least heard about the goat. I loved the goat, many other people loved the goat. But the ability to balance out those super high stakes fantasy moments, mystery building moments, with times where you can just have a solid laugh, Huge fan of whenever a show can pull that off, and I loved the way it was executed in Shadow and Bone. And don't get me wrong, it was it was pretty amazing to see Kaz. <laughs> Seeing Kaz on my television screen brought me a lot of joy. He is so important to me, and uh, I, I love him, and I'm very excited for a season two. Moving on, I want to talk about an adaptation that's a couple of years older, but I just recently watched it, so I'm gonna talk about it, and that would be Big Little Lies. This is a series based on the book Big Little Lies by Leanne Moriarty, which I read last year, I think, and I put off watching the show until I had read the book, so <laughs> I've watched the show now. I did elect not to watch season two because I'm good. I'm good. So, Big Little Lies. We start out on a school trivia night, which has somehow ended in murder. But the question of who died and who did the killing, we're not so sure about. The show is centered on five women who are all mothers who are somehow central to the question of this murder and how it took place. So we are going through their lives leading up to the school trivia night piecing together clues so that we can try to figure out 
what happened. Big Little Lies is so atmospheric and I was constantly thinking about it during Whitstable Pearl because anything set near the sea, it just brings a certain kind of calm over me. <laughs> Most likely because I've always been soothed by the ocean. <laughs> the thing about Big Little Lies is that once it has your attention, it has your attention. The fact that there's this question of the murder for the entire series is very engaging because usually you kind of know who got killed. But the fact that you're trying to work out the mystery without knowing if certain people made it out is like such an interesting layer to add to it. Also, it's one of those shows that has a ton of characters that have like not to, I, I don't seem to have a better phrase for this, who have a lot of character. As you're getting to know the main characters, you're also getting these little cuts of people the night of the school trivia night being interviewed by the police. And so you get to start to know these side characters who might only appear in a couple of moments in the central characters' lives. You get to build up kind of an idea of their stories and their secrets that they might have. The thing is, if you can make me care about a character in a television show, then you've got me. That is what I want to watch is interesting characters who are developed over time and who I can engage with even if they're not perfect, especially if they're not perfect. So there are so many different things to look at with Big Little Lies. The way that it looks at motherhood, how mothers protect their children, the way it looks at abuse, past relationships. It's all built into this small town story and I think that's a common feature of the shows I love. It's common to a few of the shows on this list. Like I said, I did decide not to watch the second season because I liked the first season so much as an adaptation that I didn't need to see the second season. I didn't need them to add to it. I felt like I got the characters. I just haven't been as enthused about that second season. So I don't know what to tell you about the second one. You can watch it if you would like, but if you want to just watch the first season of Big Little Lies, I would encourage it. It's an engaging show, it is atmospheric, it has great music, and a really good mystery. All right, let's let's turn a little bit when it comes to atmosphere so that I can talk about Lovecraft Country, which is based on a book with the same name by Matt Ruff. Lovecraft Country is a horror drama that follows a bunch of different characters in the 1950s in the United States. First character we meet is Atticus Freeman, who meets up with his uncle George and his friend Letty, and they are going on a cross-country road trip to work on George's Green Book-style guide for Black Americans traveling safely across the United States. But the other reason they are going on this trip is they are on a search for Tick's long-lost father and this drive it goes a little off the rails. They end up in landscapes of cosmic horror, powerful magic, and the racist injustices of white America. I was like enthralled by Lovecraft Country and the thing is this is a dark show. It's cosmic horror mixed with racial injustice and that makes it a lot. I, I will, it makes it a lot. However, it has some of my favorite new characters of all time. Journey Smollett and Jonathan Majors as the two more central characters are incredible. <laughs> Jonathan Majors is like just blows me away constantly. I, I can't talk enough about Jonathan Majors lately. <laughs> so you've got Letty and Tick who are both characters who are so interesting. I love Letty in particular because she is a woman who is allowed to be so angry but it's also in a show that understands that there's a history and context for angry black women which means that Letty is going to be painted in a certain way by her community and the way that they navigate that but also let Letty have her freedom to be loud, to be enraged, by what the world has done is like so good and that goes for so many other characters and it's amazing how much you get to see in one show because all of the different characters are involved in storylines that are 
so different from each other. This is also a series where family is incredibly central, so if you're up for it, if you want some atmosphere horror that is also set in the 1950s, if you're interested in engaging, super engaging characters and actors who are just giving it their all and doing an incredible job. I highly recommend Lovecraft Country. I'm really hoping that someone else is going to pick up a season two because it deserves so many more seasons. Okay, I do have to talk about one other horror show that I have watched semi-recently, watched it last year when it was brand new, and that is The Haunting of Bly Manor. It is part of a horror anthology series, and it is based on The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. The Haunting of Bly Manor, it's set in the 1980s, and it follows a young au pair named Danny, who is hired by a man to take care of his niece and nephew. Once she gets to Bly Manor, Danny meets the children, she meets the other people who she will be working with and living alongside, and she starts to witness the ghostly apparitions that seem to inhabit Bly Manor. So kind of an underlying thing with all of the shows I've been talking about really is the idea of dealing with grief, of mourning the loss of someone, and how that can be really complicated, and there's something about the way that The Haunting of Bly Manor mixes its explorations of grief with the sinister ghost of compulsory heterosexuality makes me very emotional. I knew that this show was going to have amazing performances because I love The Haunting of Hill House, which is the series that preceded Haunting of Bly Manor that is based on The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, and I loved the series so much I wound up reading the book. So there you go, another adaptation that works out. But everything that I loved about Hill House, I got in Bly Manor, and there are so many other things about Bly Manor that make me emotional. It's also a story that is heavily based on the water and the atmospheric concepts of water. Apparently, I just love that instinctually. <laughs> but if you love atmospheric horror, stuff set in the 80s, gay stuff, ghosts, grief, adaptations that reinvent stuff, definitely check out The Haunting of Bly Manor. Now I want to jump into a few of the series that I am currently watching or hoping to start soon that are adaptations, because like, as much as I've been able to watch recently, I also have my forever growing to watch list. The first I want to mention the Mysterious Benedict Society. I cannot believe that this is an adaptation that exists. <laughs> um, it is based on the Mysterious Benedict Society series by Trenton Lee Stewart, which was a book series I loved when I was younger. It was my follow-up series after I had read a series of unfortunate events and loved all of those. I got the Mysterious Benedict Society for that bit of smart kids in a, in a world that's just very strange. It's perfect if you're looking for those exact vibes. The Mysterious Benedict Society is about a character named Mr. Benedict who is on a search of the world for incredibly talented, smart, unique kids. And he wants these kids so that they can help him to infiltrate the Institute. The Institute is controlled by the nefarious Dr. Curtin, who happens to have some dastardly mind control plans. So hopefully, with the help of some very smart kids, Mr. Benedict can put a stop to it. What have I been talking about this whole time when it comes to unique characters who manage to get that balance between drama and levity? Like, over and over again, that is my fave, and that's one of the things that I loved so much about the Mysterious Benedict Society books, that Mr. Benedict is a strange character, he's a weird guy with weird plans, who also happens to be narcoleptic, and it's a book series about celebrating the uniqueness of your own identity, about being yourself to the fullest extent of what that means, and so you get that huge cast of characters that are all so unique and different, and I am positive it's going to translate so well to screen. I love the trailers that I have seen, I am a huge fan of Tony Hale, and I love a sinister mystery beneath a veneer of like cutesy, quirky settings. One of my favorite shows of all time is a show called Pushing Daisies. I love it. It's, it's, 
actually my favorite show of all time. <laughs> I know I, I'm using that word, I'm being literal this time, Pushing Daisies is my favorite show. The entire point of that show is that it is a cutesy, oversaturated wonderland, and the main character is a necromancer who uses his abilities to help solve murders. So, <laughs> I have a type, and I think that this fits it so well. I can't wait to watch it. I am also looking forward to wrapping up Sharp Objects. This is a mini-series based on the book of the same name by Gillian Flynn. Um, Sharp Objects is my second favorite Gillian Flynn book after Gone Girl. And Gone Girl is, in my opinion, one of the best adaptations. Um, to film form, I just think it's incredibly faithful to the book and it totally gets the vibe. So. Sharp Objects I've watched the first few episodes of, and I have been enjoying it so much. Talk about atmosphere once again, <laughs> and murder. Sharp Objects is a drama following Camille Preaker, who has just recently been released from a stint in the psych ward, and she is returning to her claustrophobic Missouri hometown to report on the deaths of some girls. She's a journalist, she is there to investigate because she happens to know the local people quite well and ends up being more involved in the mystery and working quite close with an out-of-town detective, Detective Richard Willis, who relies on Camille's inside knowledge of the town to help solve this murder. It's also a series about Camille being forced to confront the trauma of her youth, of her mom and her family, and kind of reckoning with that in a way that she never has before. If you've watched the video this far, I think that you'll understand exactly all of the things that this has in common with some of the other shows I love. It's a murder mystery, it's atmospheric, it's about a small town of characters who are all hiding something, and a character who knows all of them weaving through their lives and trying to piece together what everyone is hiding. Also happens to feature a couple of actors with great chemistry, Amy Adams and Chris Messina, who I have loved since Julie and Julia. Another adaptation. <laughs> They're wonderful characters. I love an odd pair. I have been really enjoying Sharp Objects. It's just one of those shows that I need time between episodes because it can hit pretty hard. The last show that I want to talk about is a show called Agatha Raisin. This is a show that specifically wound up on my radar because of my mom and because it's on Acorn TV, which is why she recommended it. Agatha Raisin is a comedy drama following the titular Agatha Raisin, a PR manager who moves to a small village hoping for a a new life that's much quieter. But after being implicated in a village murder, Agatha takes up some amateur sleuthing and she tries to get to the bottom of that mystery and the many others in her new hometown. This is a series based on the Agatha Raisin mystery series by M.C. Beaton. My mom specifically recommended it because it is a show about solving crime in a small village full of quirky characters. I mentioned earlier, my mom and I loved Doc Martin. We watched it together all the time. So she recommended this to me based on my love of that show and my love of so many of the other shows that we watched together. And I love that it's a show that kind of just embraces the fun of itself. So I'm excited to watch more. I'm excited to get into that. So that is my list, my list of adaptations that I have recently loved and some of the ones that I am most excited to watch. This didn't even scratch the surface of all of the adaptations that have happened recently and that are happening soon, but I wanted the chance to just talk about a bunch of stuff that I have loved. <laughs> You know, I think I needed the boost. So thank you so much again to Acorn TV for partnering with me on this video. I loved being able to talk about adaptations that I've loved and ones that I, I hope you will love too, ones that I hope that I'll get to and all end up loving. Please let me know in the comments down below any adaptations that you have been watching and adoring recently, and let me know if you are interested in any of the ones I talked about in this video. Remember to check out the link in my description if you want to sign up for Acorn TV, and remember my promo code BOOKNERD30 to get that 30-day free trial. Other than that, all, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope that you loved this video, and I I will see you in another one very soon. Bye!